Thank you very much and welcome. First, I want to thank Nikki and the library for the invitation to come back to share these teachings. Uh, my name is Alex Crenshaw and want to start with introducing myself. I live in Mount Shasta, California. Uh, I am part of the team of the Omram world that we are responsible of sharing the teachings of Master Omram Michael Ivanhoe. So I want to share something about my life. I used to live in Charlotte in North Carolina for six years. I'm an accountant and I was working in a petrochemical company. But in my free time, I was doing volunteering work in an organization called A Child's Place. And during the training, we were told that while the parents are working in Walmart at nine, the children are sleeping in the car. So is that possible in the US? Wow. Then I moved to Sacramento, California and I was volunteering at the Sacramento Children's Home, the oldest orphanage in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. I was there for two years, every weekend for two hours. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed a lot of abuse with the children. Mm -hmm. They need a lot of help. At the same time, I began teaching Zen Buddhism at the Folsom State Prison. I was there for three years, twice a month, teaching the inmates uh, how to improve their lives. The Folsom Prison, as you know, is one, of, is one of the oldest prisons in the US and one of the most difficult ones. Mm -hmm. Fights, drugs, gangs. But I witnessed there the deep transformation of the man thanks to the science of meditation, psychology. Even in the most difficult condition, you can do magic there. When I moved to Mount Shasta, I began what is called a casa volunteer, court appointed a special advocate. And my job is to mentor children and family and go to court. I am there outside the court in Wairica because part of my job as a volunteer, I need to go to testify on, be on behalf of the families and the children to, to the judge. And I need to read the cases and say, wow, you just scratch your head. So I mentioned this because with all this experience, I said, well, why do we have so many problems? What is this coming from? Regardless of your status, with people with money, low income. And one of the main reasons, not all of it, is we do not know how to think, how to use the mind. So it's very important that, in my opinion, that is the, one of the main reasons we have many problems. So the more we understand how this power works, the better our will be. Now, <clears throat> this talk is based on this teaching, well, on this book, The Power of Thought for Master Ombra Nikola Ivanhoe. So who was this human being? He was younger, he was from Macedonia, his teacher was Peter Dunov, and he was recognized as a great initiate in Europe. He was sent to France in 1936, and he was teaching there for 50 years. His teaching swept Europe. He was recognized, he was predicted by great initiates like Rudolf Steiner, and the Indian gurus also saw him as a great teacher. Now, so what is an initiate first? So well, what, is, what is that? Okay, we see a here, here a kind of initiate here, and we, have see, and we can see here what we see with the eyes, the stars, the trees, the sun, the moon, but on the other side, there's other dimensions that we cannot see. But a, an initiate is trained to cross the veil before you die. That's a, a Zen saying, you die before you die. You cross the veil before you do your own transition. So it's able to move back and forth be between the two worlds. That's an initiate. Mm -hmm. Now, normally, initiatic science is very, very old from Egypt. And it was kept secret. Why? For the following, if you remember the movie with Oppenheimer, remember that, uh, that movie? That 
Oppenheimer was, was able to see this side, right? And Einstein and Niels Bohr told him, do not bring that knowledge. Humanity is not ready for that knowledge. So he didn't listen, he brought the knowledge, and now the rest is history. So what happened and initiate has the, has the capability to bring very powerful knowledge to this side. Many inventions that we have, music, is coming from initiatic science. But it gives you power. Hitler was behind this science, this, this science because it gives you power. Now, Master Ombran, he was an initiate, and he decided to reveal many teachings of the science because for two reasons. Humanity destroying itself, we are in what is called the sixth mass extinction, and he said humanity is ready for this knowledge. And how profound is this science? I want you to put attention, this, uh, this painting, this is from a cathedral in Macedonia, and if you see this, <clears throat> this is from this book from Master Ombran. Watch this, observe this uh, painting here. And if we go back, same one here. Why? Because many initiates, because of the persecution, left many secrets in paintings, especially in Europe. It's a science to read the paintings of the European initiates. They left many clues on the paintings because of the persecution of the knowledge. They didn't want anybody to get into this powerful knowledge. Now, one of the basic teachings of Master Ombran to understand, well, he never wrote a book. All his teachings were transcribed. There's a total of 160 books of the knowledge that he uh, share with people, translated in more than 50 languages around the world. Basic teaching of Master Ombran of initiatic science, we have six bodies. And I want you to put attention to the number six, OK? There's a star. We have the physical body. We have the astral body, mental body, that relates to the personality, and is the lower self. We have the mental body relates to the intellect, the astral body to the heart, and the physical body to the will. We have the higher self, which is the causal body. We have the Buddhic body that has nothing to do with Buddhism. The word Buddha means the awakened one, a person that has awakened to the reality of life. In modern terms, as the quantum field says, Nikki was mentioning the work of Joe Dispenza, right? So according to the quantum field, 1% is matter and 99% is energy, right? So this is the 1% and this is the 99% that we cannot see. One of the goals of initiatic science is to train you to start to open all this that is dormant it's a process, and you start to awaken the six bodies. And you move from the lower self from, from the higher self. And this can help you quickly the level of evolution of a human being. Quickly, you can see the kind of music that the person listens, the movies, what they watch. So you can also see here the zodiac here the 12 signs of the zodiac, because we are cosmic beings. We have cosmic intelligence. So you need to understand how this cosmic intelligence affects us. And it has been a study that many changes in history, wars, uh, pandemics in the past were based on celestial bodies' influence. It's very important in the teaching here. So let's start here. Thoughts are living entities. If there is one thing that is important for you to know, it is that every thought, even the most insignificant, is a living reality. Quantum physics, quantum physics at the core. We create our own reality with our thinking. 
And being very practical, let me tell you, you cannot blame anybody for your problems. I have a friend that she told me, you know, my ex-husband, when I used to do this, she, he used to tell me one finger like this and three like this. And you know, when I was, as Nikki mentioned, I was training in the Zen tradition for seven years, and you realize that in silence, in the altar at the Zen center in Rochester, there's a Buddha sitting, right? And the, the Buddha has a pot here. And, and the Buddha is looking at the pot, and it's like a, kind of a very subtle smile. So I went to see, well, what is inside that pot? A mirror, a mirror there. You create your own reality. It's, you will realize that in your life. It takes courage to realize that, that you cannot blame anybody, zero, for your problems. Because we are walking antennas. We are cosmic beings. Cosmic intelligence has given the mightiest, most potent form of power that exists in the spirit. And every one of our thoughts is pregnant with the power of the spirit. We are very powerful. Mm -hmm. And we do not r realize how, by our thinking, we attract the people, the situations to our life. It doesn't fail. I remember very sad years ago, I was watching TV, a teenager. I mean, he was given life in prison. He was 16, 17, because he went to school with a rifle and he started to shoot his classmates. Well, all those video games, all that we just see on TV, it becomes reality. It's what is called egregore. Mm -hmm. Egregore. Egregore, Master Orman has a book. Whatever you think, if you put a, no, a, a lot of concentration, it takes form. Mm -hmm. You know that we have parasites in the body, right? Well, there are parasites floating around. Those are the egregores. Mm -hmm. Knowing this, each one of you has the possibility of becoming a benefactor of mankind by projecting your thoughts into the farthest reaches of space. There have been studies in when cities where there is violence, when people meditate, crime goes down. But when people leave, crimes goes up again. Study. This is what is called the butterfly effect. Because, again, quantum field, 99% is energy, 1% is matter. That is the reason, you know, people go to monasteries just to, because they do not know how, how to use the mind. And they get into troubles and they run to a monastery because that is going to solve my problems. Well, you can go to a monastery, but if you, not, if you do not know how the mind functions, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. People are sitting there for a year with all that hate in their hearts. So it's important. That is the reason there are, there are so many rules because they are trying to teach you how to use the mind, basically. That's the goal. He or she who undertakes this work knowingly and deliberately gradually penetrates into the mysterious arcana of divine creation. What is arcana? That's what is secret. I am a business consultant and I use this book, The Master Key Arcana from Charles Hanil. And uh, this book was suppressed. It was written in 1920s because it contains a lot of teaching from initiatic science. Uh, just as a note, one of the people that I follow is Helen Keller. She's, very, she's an example, this woman. For me, she's one of the best Zen teachers. But the reason, as you know, Helen Keller, she was blind and she went deaf. I mean, it's another dimension. But at the age of, of 13, she was introduced to the teachings of Emanuel Swedenborg a Swedish initiate. Swedenborg, he opened his spiritual eye and he was able to see everything. So he wrote that in the 1700s, but, but he was respected because he was the advisor of the Queen of Sweden. And then 
he was an initiate, and then Helen Keller, at the age of 13, a person read to her the work of Emanuel Swedenborg, and she said, thanks to those teachings, I did what I did. That woman met every president of the US. I mean, who can do that blind and deaf? And she said, the teachings of Swedenborg saved me. Charles Hanil, he studied the teachings of Swedenborg. Those are initiates. Very important principle. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Everything in your life is so important. Whatever you are thinking is vibration. Again, you are walking antennas. And energy never dies. And that's when the questioning starts. What happens when we die? We'll talk about that. Thoughts are living entities. Science has proved that human thought is capable of penetrating great depths of water. Some of you are familiar with the work of the late Masaru Emoto. And they did a study in Japan. There was in Tokyo a very polluted river. And they brought uh, Buddhist monks, because as you know, Japan is a Buddhist country, to pray to the water. And then the crystal of the water transformed to a beautiful crystal. So we can change reality. And then, as you know, he did all these studies about when you say, I love you, thank you, when you play Mozart music to the water, when you pray. Look at the beautiful crystals that it creates. Now, what do you notice in common? How many sides? OK. How many bodies do we have? How many sides? One, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. Some of you are aware of what is called a structure water, special water when you, when you clean it. The, the, the cleanest water in the planet is called a structure. And when they study the water, it has the shape. It has six sides. And that nourishes your brain. Mm -hmm. Very important. It is essential for you to know and understand, henceforth, that nothing is more important than to be aware and vigilant about your thoughts. This is why people go to monasteries, basically. They look at sacred geometry. They are with the mantras the whole day. That's what they are doing, because they know. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a remote viewer, very famous, Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan used to work for the US government, for the CIA. And Ingo wrote great books about what he saw. He wrote a book in two volumes, Secrets of Power. And he said, you know why they invest so much money to control you? Because you have so much power, they, don't, they do not want you to know. They don't want you to know how powerful you are. They spend millions, billions of dollars to keep you like a zombie, li li literally. You know how much it costs 30 seconds in the, in the Super Bowl, 30 seconds of an ad? Seven million dollars for 30 seconds. Because it works. They know. They know. I mean, who's going to invest seven million dollars for 30 seconds? It works because they know it. They know how to penetrate in the subconscious. They get you. It's very important. An important principle is to concentrate. There are many exercises of, of concentration. Years ago, when I was in Charlotte, there was an article from the, in the newspaper. Harvard did a, a study. Why people are unhappy? So and they said, you know, and according to the story, the more fragmented your mind is, the more unhappy you are. Doesn't fail. And they mentioned the cell phones. That's a problem. People's minds are very fragmented. Because 
the cell phone companies or the, or the big companies in Silicon Valley discovered that they can activate your dopamine with the cell phone. Dopamine is what gives you life. And the cell phone creates cheap dopamine. There are some people that are doing this constantly. They know. Also, for example, in the past, or when you look for a job now, they, what they tell you, oh, you need to be multitasking because you're more efficient. No. As, uh, according to studies, the mind doesn't work like that. You need to be one, doing one thing at, at a time. That's when the human mind is more effective, not doing several things at the same time. That is the reason the more you know this, now there is nothing wrong with the cell phones, but it's a weapon and they are controlling you. And, and this consultant ma mentioned about that, every time you grab, you go for that reaction, is the same based on the studies that you inhale a line of, of cocaine. It creates that addiction in the mind. It's, that is what is called the dopamine effect. They know how it works. Concentration is one of the most necessary faculties in a great many branches of activity. Engravers, surgeons, and acrobats all know how important it is. A surgeon make him, oh, sorry, you die. <laughs> well, no, you need to concentrate. You are, you are very effective when you concentrate in anything in life, in music, in painting. One of the best exercises in concentration that I have given you is to meditate in front of the rising sun. To focus all your powers of concentration on the sun to the exclusion of every other thought. And that has many benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the members of the group, she, she said, and this is the power of the sun. One person, she was low in calcium. And then, and then while looking at the sun, she was inhaling cal calcium from, from the sun. She went to the doctor, and the doctor told her, you have a lot of calcium in your body. What is that coming from? She was inhaling that from the sun. And this is very old science that we, because we are cosmic beings, we can inhale energy from the cosmos. That's the basis of Qigong of Surya Yoga from India that is called sun energy because we are walking antennas. Every organ of the human body is connected to a planet. That is the reason it's very important to maintain the body clean. We have too many toxins in the body. It weakens you because we are receiving constantly these particles from the space confirmed by science. A stardust, that's what it's called. Even also, every star, every planet sings cosmic tones. Same with the human organs. So you need to align to that. So part of initiatic training is to refine the human body to listen to the cosmos. Then, now, you understand how you need to refine this device. You need to prepare the mind to receive teachings. Mm -hmm. If you manage to do this properly, you will soon feel strengthened, enlightened, and fulfilled. And if an organ of your body is ill, you can do a great deal to make it better by directing a ray of sunlight into its cells. It's a very advanced practice. But is this, this is one of the most important practices of Master Ombran, sun energy. I didn't prepare that, but in my research I, about, about the physical aspect of the sun, there was a clinic in, in Switzerland. It's called heliotherapy. And there was a girl that she had the spine like this, like seven-year-old, she, it was crook. She was like a big, I mean, she was like a curve. She was exposed to the sun for months. The spine went back to normal, just with sun energy. Does the people get depressed? 
When I was uh, at the Zen Center in Rochester, we had people coming from all over the world. And one of my roommates was from Sweden. He told me, oh yeah, people with, in Finland, number one rate of suicide in Europe <laughs> because there is not enough sun in Finland. They get depressed. The importance of the sun. We're in offices, in the computer, get out. In Master Armand School, we go out every morning to watch the sun. But it's just not sitting there. You start to attract that energy from the sun. And talking about initiatic science, I did a lot of uh, Taoist alchemy. The Taoists are very, also very similar. They're in China, in the mountains of China. Uh, and according to the Taoist, the advanced teacher, they said, yeah, there are people living in the sun. There are other dimensions. There are people living there. A Master Omran, in his book, he said the same. There, there are people living there. I can see them. Not on the physical plane, but there are other dimensions. There are other entities living there. It's a living entity. Mm -hmm. There are so many drugs available nowadays. You can cure anything by swallowing a pill. Why bother to concentrate? This is disastrously faulty reasoning. A passive attitude like that is no, is no way to become stronger, nor, above all, to develop the immense inner forces that which will continue to serve you even after you have left, left this earth. This is the most important part of this quote. All this is preparation to go through the gate of death. In the Buddhist tradition, there is a practice called powa. And in powa, you start to visualize that there is a light going up to the sky. <laughs> Because what happens if you study people that have died and come back, that what they share, if you are not ready, you will see all these parasites getting after you. So you need to train yourself to go to that moment. It's a reality, but we are distracted with that, with TV, with the internet, because it's going to happen. Like as, as, as I'm saying, you do not know where but, or when, but it's going to happen. It's preparation for that. Mm -hmm. That is the reason this ancient tradition left instruction. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, th th those are manuals that help you to pass that moment. Every thought that you have now is preparation for that moment. Every little second. That, that is the reason in many traditions that's what is called dream practice. The Celtics, the Druids, the Egyptians, the Taoists, the Buddhists, because they know every night we die. Remember the six bodies, the astral realm? Every night we go to the astral realm when we go to sleep. That's what we do. We die every night. We practice, so why not practice consciously? Mm -hmm. I love the case of Anita Murjani. How the power of thought. So, as you know, Anita Murjani, Indian, and she developed a cancer, a tumor, that she developed balls uh, of the size of a, of a golf ball in her body for four years. I mean, she looked great there, but if you see the pictures when she had the cancer, it was like just bones, bare bones. So she clinically died. She died, clinically. And then on the other side, she found out the reason of the tumor, her body. What, what happened to Anita, she's Indian and she was in an arranged marriage and she escaped. She said, you know, I can do this. I want, to, I want to love my life, I want to do whatever I want. So she fled, she abandoned her parents, and then she has a lot of guilt. She had a lot of guilt. And she found out that the reason of the tumor was the guilt that she had. When she saw that, she had two options based on her guys. You can stay here or you can go back to fulfill your mission. Because we all have a mission in this lifetime. No matter your age, that is called the science of epigenetics. Everyone has a mission. It's in your DNA. It's dormant. And 
another paradigm, oh, I am too old, that's nonsense. In the Taoist tradition, one of the best teachers, well, he was 80 when he did it. He became one of the best teachers. So that's part of the programming that we have, I am too old, and we'll see that later. But Anita Murjani said, I became a doormat. I was not expressing myself, and that caused the tumor. So speak up, express yourself. You know, there's a, an, an Australian nurse called Bonnie Ware. She wrote The Five Regrets of the Dying. Excellent book. She was working in hospice. She worked with young, rich people, you name it, every human being for many years. But she saw that when they were ready to die, they have similar regrets. And she wrote the book, The Five Regrets of the Dying. And she remembered a woman, very rich woman, wealthy woman. And she married a wealthy man. He gave her everything, but everything. But because of that, she told Bronnie, you know, Bronnie, I regret that. Do not allow anybody to control your life. Don't do that. It's not worth any money because I did it. My husband gave me everything, but that's not what I wanted at the end. So it's very important to align to your mission. Again, it's preparation to cross this veil. Mm -hmm. That's one of the goals of initiatic science, to prepare for this moment. So important. Like a Zen teacher said, yeah, if you do not do the work, well, you go to the laundry machine of reincarnation and you come back. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's the way. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law of mathematics. Again, Nico, Nikola Tesla said, everything is energy, frequency, and vibration, but energy never dies. Where do you go? You must realize that only one thing is truly important for a human being, and that is the ability to concentrate on a divine reality, whatever that is the definition for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. But it's always to keep your, and there's the secret of that. If everything is frequency, this raises your frequency. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. You raise your frequency. When you listen to that piece of music, when you are in love, true love, genuine love for a human being, you raise your frequency. So important. Especially now, uh, one of the problems that, that, that I see as a casa volunteer that with all these kids, in general, at the orphanage, people do not choose the right partner. They do not choose the right person. And that's one of the main problems. You need really, in ancient times, people knew about this. How important is your partner? Why? Especially if you have a long-term vision. There's a great classic from, from Michael Newton, as you know, uh, Life Between Lives, that he was an skeptical. I don't believe in reincarnation, another life, that's nonsense. He was a psychotherapist and suddenly, Stumble on that with his patients. And I remember something then, she began to go deeper and say, well, yeah, this is true. Another one is Brian Wise from Hay House. It was the same, he said, this is nonsense. And suddenly, and it was very funny because the person that Brian Wise took in, into hypnosis told Brian Wise things that only he knew because his son died and the woman told him, you know, this, and he was, whoa. But what I remember from, from Michael Newton, he said, you know, when people go to the other side, the first thing uh, that they do is to find for the, for, the person, for the person that they love the most. And it's a happiness that they cannot describe. So it's really important to find the right partner. It's so important for your evolution and for the evolution of society. I said with these children, I saw just the marriage. Okay, that's the reason. One of the kids that I have, it's, he was only 16 and 
he was in jail for five times. Five times. So why? Mm -hmm. It is this that will enable people to continue the progress in peace for the rest of eternity. It's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Your ability to concentrate endures after death because it is not the product of the brain but of the immortal spirit. We are immortal beings. That's what we are. We are immortals. There's something that does not die. A great teacher said, I am not made of flesh, blood, or bones. That is not my essence. Again, I am not made of flesh, blood, and bones. We are immortals. And then you need to develop that. Part of initiatic science is to give you vision of life. Mm -hmm. That you are very powerful. Some people in power, they know about this science and they control humans. That's what they do. A disciple who has acquired the, the habit of concentrating on luminous subjects will be very powerful on the other side. It's going to give you power. This is one of the best investments in your life to understand what happened on the other side. What is going to happen? Mm -hmm. How is the, the other side that makes a big influence and what is happening here? We do not know. We need to develop our vision. That's what I mentioned, Helen Keller. Because Swedenborg saw what is happening on the other side. And then he wrote it. And then he left instructions. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, Swedenborg could talk with angels openly. We humans have that ability in the past. If you study the Essenes, the ancient Essenes, they have that ability. But we lost it because we got corrupted. Mm -hmm. One only needs to concentrate on light to dispel difficulties and darkness. You must get into the habit of concentrating every day on the most elevated subjects. Whatever inspires you, raise your frequency. And what is going to help you when you fulfill your mission in this lifetime is in your DNA. It's there. Epigenetics. It's going to help you to see, okay, where do I go? What is next in my life? For example, William Bullman, one of the uh, well-known out-of-the-body practitioner that he wrote books, very good books. And he describes that, his experiences getting out of the body. And whatever are your thoughts now will create your reality on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, just to give you an example, I was studying with a rabbi. And there's a movie from Made in Heaven with uh, Kelly McGillis and uh, Timothy Hutton from the 80s. And, he, and the rabbi said, you know, what is in that movie? It's true. That's the way it works. Made in Heaven. Made in Heaven with, with uh, Timothy Hutton and Kelly McGillis. Ke Kelly McGillis. Is it M-A-I-D or M-A-D-E? M-A-D. -E? Made in Heaven. So... William Bullman relates on this book the following. He got off his body. He was in the astral dimension. And he saw like a kind of, a, kind of a religious church. He went there with his astral body. And he saw all these fanatics yelling at him, get out of here. Because they were fanatics. Well, well they were on, on this planet. And they took th those ideas to their side. And they were doing the same for eternity. And he got out from there, well, I don't want to be here with these people, these are fanatics. So he continued his journey. Mm -hmm. So the point that we do it at night to make, the, to make this conscious, because this is evolution. You evolve faster, that's what you do. 
how thoughts materialize on the physical plane. What is it, how it works, how it materializes physically, and what conditions must be present for it to materialize? If it is not clear in your minds, you will always have a certain number of problems that you are unable to solve. Well, in the case of Anita Morjani, she developed this tumor because she, was, she has all this guilt. But being a doormat, she was a doormat. She said, I was a doormat. And my mission is to teach people not to be a doormat, to express yourself. For example, I was in a conference with Joe Dispenza and Greg Braden, and they were talking about energy, and a woman said that she, now there's a lot of uh, prostate cancer in men, right? And this woman shared that, you know, she saw this man, and because they do not express themselves, the energy goes down, and that's how the cancer starts for men because people are not expressing themselves. Again, if you do not know how it works, you get sick. What I shared about this teenager was watching video games the whole day and you're not gonna kill my classmates. Thought is a force and energy, but it's also an extremely subtle matter, which operates in a remote region, far removed from the physical plane. Mm -hmm. because we believe that we're a body, we're more than that. Let's watch a video about the power of the mind. So any discussion regarding this feeling-based prayer, this lost mode of prayer, uh, sometimes seems a little more than academic uh, until we can actually apply it in our lives or see it applied in our lives. It's in the late 1990s that I had the opportunity to do precisely that. When I saw the footage documenting uh, the healing of a life-threatening condition within the body of a living woman using precisely the kinds of techniques that we're speaking about right now, for me it was this kind of information that took this lost modality of prayer out of the realm of, of academics and into something that's very real that we can apply in our lives. I had the opportunity during that time to see some video footage of the healing of a three inch diameter bladder cancer inside the body of a woman who by medical western medical standards had been diagnosed inoperable. She had gone as a last resort to a medicineless hospital in Beijing, China. It was in this medicineless hospital where they began simply by addressing uh, the life affirming ways that she could change how she was living her life. They taught her life affirming ways to breathe and life affirming ways to nourish her body gentle movements to stimulate the energy centers in her body. And as she was doing these and strengthening her body, at one point it made sense to undergo a process. Now I'd like to, to share this, I'd like to describe it to you uh, as a very potent example of how the feeling world inside of our bodies has a direct effect, uh, in this case a very graphic effect, on the world beyond our bodies. So in the video documentation, the film shows a woman lying on a, uh, in, in a hospital room. She's fully awake, she's fully conscious, she believes in the process that's about to happen. Before her, there is an ultrasound technician who is running an ultrasound wand over her lower abdomen that we can see on a split screen television. And on the left hand side of the screen, they do a snapshot, a freeze frame of an instant in time for reference so we can see what her condition looked like in that instant in time. On the right-hand side of the screen, we are able to watch real-time as three practitioners stand behind her, working with the energy in her body and with the feelings in their bodies. And what they do is they begin to chant a word that to them, they've agreed upon, that it reinforces the feeling within them that she's already healed. The chant essentially says, already healed, already done. And as they begin, to, to have this feeling and to say these words among themselves on the computer screen, on the television screen, we can watch in real time this cancerous tumor as it disappears in less than three minutes real time. It's not like time lapse on a documentary where you see a rose unfold uh, in 30 seconds and it's something that normally takes days. This literally happens in less than three minutes 
her body responded to the feelings of the practitioners who were trained to have the kinds of feelings that they were having. And all they were feeling was the feeling of what it feels like to be in the presence of a woman who is already healed, fully enabled, fully capacitated. They were not seeing her as a woman who was sick, and they weren't saying, bad cancer, you've got to go away. It's a very, very different way of thinking about things, and it's a very graphic example of precisely how, uh, how this principle works. I had the opportunity to speak to the gentleman, Luke Chen, that actually created this film. And I asked him a question. I said, what if those three practitioners weren't there? So could this woman have done this? Could any of us do this on our own? And he smiled at me when I asked him the question. He said, he said, Greg, in all probability, she probably could have done it alone. However, there's something about us humans in that we seem to feel more empowered and stronger when we're supported by others in the things that we believe in and the things that we choose to accomplish. So while she probably could have had this feeling and done it herself, having these three practitioners work with her uh, was the threshold that it took for her body to respond. All they were doing was having the feeling as if she were already healed, and in less than three minutes her body responded. What Western physics now is beginning to tell us is that the same energy, the same field, that led to the healing in this woman's body also leads to peace between nations. It's the same thing, different scale, same principle. And I've been involved in experiments where hundreds of thousands of people joined together through the World Wide Web. We were coordinated on the internet at a given hour of time, a window of time, when we were trained to feel the feelings of peace in our bodies during that time. And when we did that, statistically, what happened in events around the world, there were wartime events, there were uh, 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 bombings, air, aerial bombings in Iraq that were scheduled, that were reversed during the window of time when this prayer was happening. Crimes against people declined, emergency hospital room visits declined. There are, was a computer research project at Princeton University that was able to document the field of consciousness on a global level while these prayers were going on and they saw a, a little glitch, a, a glyph on the screen indicating that consciousness was responding to hundreds of thousands of people feeling the feeling of peace in the moment that it was occurring. And what this tells us is that the field we're working with is a measurable field. You can pick it up with equipment that could be measured uh, on the computer screen. This was part of the uh, uh, the, the research project at Princeton University that was called the Global Consciousness Project. So the field is real, it's out there, and it responds to us in ways now that we're only beginning to understand. Even more recently, the research has been done by the scientist Masaru Emoto regarding the relationship between human emotion, human feeling, and water drops. It's showing this relationship even more poignantly. What has happened is that these scientists, this particular research project, has discovered that droplets of water that make up over 70% of our world anyway and 70% of our bodies, that these droplets of water respond to human emotion whether it is felt in the body or as it is actually written on labels. They're placed on the vials of water and the emotion of the researcher as the labels are being written and placed onto those vials. The vials are then frozen for a, a specific period of time, removed from the freezing process, and as they begin to thaw, they crystallize. And the crystals are the telltale sign of what is happening with the emotion. For example, they've taken water, highly polluted, highly toxic water, from some of the most uh, 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 polluted dams in the center of Japan. This water has never been known to crystallize. They just can't get it to crystallize. And when you look at it under a microscope, what you see, it's a very muddy, very nebulous, form, there's no symmetry, there's no uh, uh, crystalline structure whatsoever before the emotions are in place. After the emotions are there, for example, when 500 people pray over some of this most polluted water, the before image shows the water in its toxic state. The after image of the same water shows this water beautifully formed, beautifully clear, beautifully crystalline, perfectly symmetrical, purely from the result of human emotion interacting 
and human feeling interacting with this field of water. Some of the other research has shown families where children and their parents have encircled a vial of water in a room that has never been found to crystallize. Again, some of the very highly polluted and toxic water. And what they do, they make a game out of it. The children, they send love to the water. They say, we love you, water. We appreciate you, water. Thank you, water, for what you bring to our world and our lives. And in that innocence, they are eliciting these genuine states of emotion. And as the research continues, it is precisely these vials of water that have received this kind of energy from, uh, from the children and their families, feelings that the ancients called prayer that the water begins to crystallize into beautiful, uh, symmetrical, very clear forms, showing once again that there's a direct effect between, uh, between what we feel in our bodies and what's happening in the world beyond our bodies. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, very poignant example of how each of us has an opportunity to participate, not to control and manipulate, but rather participate in the events of our world the events of our lives, our families, our communities, and our bodies through the field that links all in creation. Well, we can comment on the video for hours, but one of the teachings is first one. How it's possible that a tumor that take, that took many some years was done in three minutes? Because time is an illusion in the quantum field doesn't exist. Another key part of the video is about she believed in them. She didn't know cure. So, because that's the power of your thoughts. And the other part of that, the question, well, was she able to do it her, herself alone? Yes, but you need the training. You need to know how the mind works. Mm -hmm. Take some training mm -hmm. because we are conditioned from childhood mm -hmm. to misuse the mind. So there's a lot of teaching also about those those were Qigong masters trained, and also is the power of the voice. Again, they were doing a special sounds, <coughs> and they were able to reduce close the intention. It's intention and the sound. It's like a formula. The intention is so important. Where is your mind? Constant. Where is your mind? Thoughts as energy, force, or vibration is picked up by the antenna connected to certain certain centers in our bodies. Okay, for example, I'm on radio every week. And I was talking, I talk about different topics like this one. So I was talking about Holotropic breathing. Do you know what is that? Holotropic? Yes, sir. Okay. Holotropic, you start to inhale deeply, exhale. Inhale, exhale. And they play at the same time a special music with no lyrics. And what happened, people start to remember memories from childhood. People can see when, when they were conceived. Uh -huh. So it's very powerful. And then the radio host asked me, well, what is that energy store? She told me, OK. And I told her, so imagine in the building that, that, that you are, there's an antenna, right? She said, yes. OK, that antenna that transmits all the signals that you are talking or receiving, the, it, it weighs 500 tons, whatever. She said, yes, OK. When you transmit information, on, it increases the weight? Say, so, well, no. When you release that information, it does, decreases the weight? No, it's the same weight. Well, that's the same. But can you see all those uh, transmissions? And no. Well, that's one. We have seven, the humans. We have seven antennas. That's the energy that is stored there. It's invisible. What is that? the six bodies. We can see one, but we have other five that we cannot see. That's the energy that is stored there. Well, we are walking antennas. With this antenna, which are located in the brain or an even higher level in the etheric region, start to vibrate. 
they transmit messages to other instruments or other humans. And trees and the ocean. Other people, as Greg mentioned, the experiment of people where crime went, up, went, went down, praying people, where there is war. Lid Matagar does that. So that's what we do with this instrument, that we're learning how to use it properly, basically. We do not know. If a human being succeeds in setting up an analogous series of connections within himself, his thought can produce tangible results on the physical plane immediately. We saw it in the video, right? We saw it there. They healed this woman with just that intention, with just that concentration. There were, and they said, that's another point of the video. They said this, this, these Qigong doctors, there is no cancer, that doesn't exist. Then they say, okay, we're gonna cure the cancer. No, they say, this doesn't exist. Now, that's very important. Let, let me tell you why. Some people said, well, there is no problems in the world. That's an illusion. In a way, it's true. But it, it's true in another. So it takes, it takes wisdom, really, not to avoid, oh, there are no problems. Everything is okay. Well, no, we know that we have problems, right? <laughs> but in a way, they do not exist. So these doctors, because they were trained with that wisdom, they said, this cancer doesn't exist at all, and it's gone. So you do not negate the problem, but you do not place your attention there. Because whatever you put your attention, it magnifies. It takes training. OK, sure. Oh, you're welcome. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, you're welcome. This is an example of how we create our own reality. Two twin sisters, okay? Josephine, at the age of 92, oh, thank you, works part time in a hospital, drives her car to church, meets her four bridge groups, buys her own grocery, has to leave three of her six brothers. Her twin identical sister at the age of 92, obviously, is incontinent, had a hip replacement, has a degenerative disorder that destroys most of her vision, has dementia. Okay. How do you explain to me two twin sisters with the same genes? Different outcome. We are not subject to our genes from birth. That is epigenetics. We can change our destiny. That's the proof. Look at her. We create our own reality. We can change the cells of our body by the emotions. And because it's there. It's there. We know deeply in our subconscious. It is there. That's what is called the story of the blue zones. And that's what they said, Greg Braden mentioned, the value of the community. As you know, the Blue Zone, they didn't study around the world. The longest, people living the longest in the world, the best communities, people living more than 100. People drink, smoke, eat meat, they are not vegetarians, and they live beyond 100 years old. Community, strong community. Limited, they eat limited yes. meat, they eat healthy fruits and vegetables that they grow themselves. <clears throat> so they have health things they choose that's making them healthy. Yeah, some of them, yes, thank you. Some of them do, yes, some of them. But one that I saw in Spain, in the mountains in Spain, people live for over 100, and they walk a lot, close to nature. That's an important factor also, close to nature. But is the mind. Mm -hmm. And thanks for the comment. Yes, it's true. They, what's common in all of them is they live with a much lower level of stress than we live yes, here. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The stress. And it's the community. That's the value of the community. During COVID, many people left the planet. Because of that, they were lonely. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the science, right? This book, The Genium of Your Genes and the Biology of Belief, the classic books that began this uh, revolution. How to use the mind. This is not new. Mm -hmm. The thoughts projected by man produce an effect in his higher regions, therefore, and set his subtle instruments in motion. All this training is a refinement of the personality, purification of the personality. That's what it is. Again, subtle instruments in motion. These six that we cannot see, we can only see the physical body. You have more here. Mm -hmm. Thought can pass through walls and physical objects without a trace in order to get it to take effect on the material level. You have to build bridges, a series of intermediaries. And that's here one of the, this kind of a formula, okay? How do you do it? This is the meaning of that famous saying of Archimedes, give me a lever and I will move the earth. There must be an intermediary, a bridge, and that intermediary is feeling emotions. When it enters the dimension of the emotions, an idea takes on flesh and blood and becomes capable of influencing matter. Emotion is the key. You can do affirmations the whole day in front of the mirror, but if you do not add emotion, it's going to take you a long time. Emotion is what change re changes reality. You need to add that feeling. Why do, get, why do you think people are sick? Because they have all this anger. That's the proof. All this sadness, depression. You age faster. That's emotion. Change the emotion. Be more positive. Who be, you need to monitor who is around you. The news that you watch. Your work environment. All that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions, comments, any questions? Any comments? Thank for your comment. Any questions? Something that you want to add to ask? Uh, yes. On the diagram, it had the causal body, and then off to the right, it had re re reason. Yes. Okay. Could you explain a little more about the causal? Okay. <clears throat> we have the intellect and the reason. The reason is when there's wisdom, you add wisdom to the intellect. Because many people are very smart, but they are broke. Or they are very smart and they are very unhappy. They are divorced, so they have many problems because there is no reason. So that's an, that's an example. So the more you learn about this and the more you integrate, your life will be better. So that's the goal of this, okay, there's reason, there's a whole science behind, okay, what is reason? Mm -hmm. About, and one of the glues, okay, or, well, or the glue of this, we can say, are the emotions. Mm -hmm. There is so many traditions, they are singing, dancing, every tradition in the world, Africa, whatever, there's dancing, singing, because they know, express themselves. And they are trying to work on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. Yeah, it takes time just to... And Master Ombran, in all his books, he left instructions and detail about each one. Okay, what is the meaning of this and how you combine? How to integrate? That's the goal of initiatic science, to combine all these bodies to have a better life, basically. Yeah, that's what we do. Yes? Can you say more about the body body? Well, the buddhic body, well, the buddhic body is, is the awakened mind. We, we are all awake, but we forgot. Another way of saying is uh, remembering who we are. Uh, the, the awakened mind is the mind that knows there, uh, there is something beyond this physical body. That there's, for example, in the Buddhist tradition, there's a singing, was, it's a quote, it says, the four characteristics of the Buddhic body, eternal, joyous, selfless, and pure. 
That is your inherent nature. We are eternal, we are selfless, we are joyous, and we are pure. We are pure beings. And the goal of this is to decondition. This is a process of deconditioning a lot. So that is the buddhic body. Now, obviously, why it's there? Because you need to do that work. For example, if you want to know what you need to work to reach to this level, write down your dreams. Have a dream journal. Excellent practice to evolve faster. Because what is suppressed in the subconscious mind is revealed through dreams. There is some Carl Jung, he studied the dream practice, he did the, the dream practice, and he was studying the dreams. So, because in essence, we are that. It's like a <clears throat> we, are, we are eternal, we are selfless, we are joyous, we are, we are pure, but we forgot. And because we are bringing from past life all these habits, that we have the opportunity to to undo all those habits that sabotage our life, that's the work that we need to do in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's coming from there. That is the buddhic body. It is there. So um, what if, what does it recall their dreams? So I've really lived a life where very rarely uh -huh. do I recall my dreams. I've often wondered what's keeping that dream escape. Mm -hmm. Well, you dream, but you don't remember. Uh, to remember your dreams, there are some practices that you can do before you go to bed. Right. And it's going to help you to remember the dreams. For example, there are some of the instructions. You get up at 3 AM, read a book, go back to sleep, and then you will remember your dreams. Because they will tell you what you need to work. Mm -hmm. For example, the dream that I had for years that I was fighting with somebody, but I couldn't defend myself until I processed that during the daytime, that dream went away. And that's, that was one of my lessons that I needed to work. That is the reason in every tradition they do what is called dream practice, because it's a way to accelerate your evolution. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps you to do that. And uh, does that answer your question? About, uh, about the buddhic body? What is that? Yeah. It's one of the characteristics that we are, we are, we are perfect beings. Mm -hmm. So can you go up a step and speak of the atmic body? Well, this is the highest one. The atmic body is what it's called. It's coming from the Hindu tradition, the, the Atman, that, we're, that we, in essence, were gods. That is the atmic body. When we reach that godly self, that we're gods. But we forgot it. Mm -hmm. That's every tradition. Is that come from the Egyptian tradition? Did you say no? No. It's the the Atman the Admi called from the word Atman, yeah. from the Hindu tradition, the Atman. But it's, it's the God level, that we are God. But we forgot it. And this is the journey of remembering from here to here. Yes, it's, that's the journey. <laughs> can, can we become... Oh. Yes. How do you distinguish between soul and spirit? Okay. The spirit is perfect. It doesn't need evolution. It's, it's, it's perfect. The soul is what, that's my interpretation. The soul is what incarnates because this is what is called a schoolroom earth. We have lessons to learn, and that's the soul. The spirit doesn't need to learn anything. It's perfect. But you come here to learn lessons to keep evolving. So, and it's, yeah. Yeah. Can we become conscious of the atmic body? And is that the bliss that the yogis, some of the yogis in India speak of, say? That's the goal, yes. Yes. And another part, that's a good question now. When I mentioned about, about Master Rambran, when the gurus in India saw him, they, they really respected him because they recognized him. He was a rishi in a past life. Who are the rishis? The rishis were the founders of the 
Indian civilization. He wrote part of the Vedas in a past life. But he reincarnated in the West because that was his mission, because he said he came to reinterpret all this ancient knowledge because he said something that is true. The psychic structure of the Westerners is different from the people from India. That's the reason some people struggle. They go to India, it's okay, but they say, we are different. We are not Asian, we are not Hindus. We are Westerners. So he adapted the teachings very ancient to the West, but, and I know that because gurus from India came to see him to France, because they said, yeah, this was in the past, he was a, a great master. But that was his mission during his lifetime, to reinterpret the teachings for the Westerners. That's all, that is the reason his teachings swept Europe and the US, because they said, well, this is a great teacher. He did, and that was his, his, his mission. Because some people, yeah, it's true, we can achieve that. Few people have done it, but it's possible. And that was his mission to, okay, do it. Mm -hmm. Don't give your power to anybody. He says that, don't look at me as a guru. I mean, I'm just giving you the instructions. And that's true. That, that, that is why I like his teachings because in the Zen tradition, there are no gurus. You do not need a guru anymore. That was in the past, but gurus are over. That was his main teaching. Gurus are over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you find him? Very interesting question. Well, I knew about his teachings. I had his books because I studied in Shadik science. And when I got books from Europe, because in Shadik science is very strong in Europe. And some of the people that I read that said they, some of them mentioned him. This, is a, this was a great teacher. But then the first retreat in the US was in Mount Shasta in 2022. So people came from five continents. So I went there and I met people from Switzerland, from Canada, from France. And what amazed me, a chief of a tribe from Nigeria, blind, she came from Nigeria because she said, this, is, this was a great teacher. And that's how I met the group. And then that's what I want to share the, for example, so he, passed. he passed in 86, yes. But that's, that's what amazed me. He passed in 86 and his teaching is still continue because in my opinion, when a teacher dies, the school goes down, but he's going stronger. There are three centers. When he was alive, this is France. I was there last year. When he was alive, there were 1,600 people there. This is Switzerland, the school in Switzerland. This is Canada. So uh, I was, last year I went to Switzerland, I went to, I mean, uh, to France, and I went to Canada. And because he left this legacy of profound teachings. So, and that's how I found about him. It's very important to see people. I mean, it's, it's okay to read books, but meeting the people there, and we have the annual meeting in, in September we are full already, there's a waiting list, but uh, that's what we do. There's some meditation, there's singing, there's yoga nutrition, there are walks, workshops, uh, there's a dance, there are prayers, and there's a feast of St. Michael fire. And uh, Rudolf Steiner predicted him. He said, a teacher called Michael will come to bring new teachings to the West. And yeah, he's, that's what I like from him. He's a great teacher. He was a great teacher. So, um, you have an accent. You come from somewhere. From Mexico. From Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so this journey of yours, and <clears throat> now when you're saying 2022 is when you actually really did encounter him. Well, no, I encountered her before in 2017, me. but meeting the people, yeah. that make a, a big difference in my journey. Okay. Because I have lived in several spiritual centers. So I always, I like to meet the people. Mm -hmm. Because it's, as the saying says, if you want to know the teacher, see the people, meet the people. Right, so I, I met the people and for example, I remember People came from Switzerland, and I asked them, 
What do you like about this teacher? Because we Swiss are very strong mind and we do not like uh, any teacher. This was a great teacher. It's true. So that's, that's, that was my journey because, and especially for this, he adapted the teachings to the West because that's what I mentioned myself at the beginning of all that I have seen at the prison, at the orphanage. He left good teachings to solve the problems, society, because one of his main teachings is about pregnancy. He, play, he, play, he said, who is going to lead the future of humanity? Women. Women hold the future, the mothers. He wrote many books about that, about the importance of mothers, how to find the right partner. So, uh, yeah. <coughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, the principle of, of calming the mind to the point where it reflects the light, like a <coughs> calm pond. Uh, are there any teachings or books or something I can access that teaches yes. about that? Calming, well, quiet the mind. Okay, I brought the book. The one, uh, okay, if you want to see the books, first, uh, let me show you. You can go to this website, Ombran Word. This is the US website and you can go to the book section. Of the 160 books that there are, only 50, only 50 are in English. <laughs> because there's still a lot of material. Now, go there, you can subscribe to the newsletter and you can get um, emails. We meet once a month online. Now, to that, there's a sign called Yana Yoga. He wrote a book about that in two volumes. Well, he spoke about that. There are two books about that topic. About that, how to calm the mind. Because you need to understand also, it's very important to understand the subconscious mind. It's very important. Because 95% of what we do is influenced by the subconscious mind. So you can do all, all practices and all that, but if you do not understand how the subconscious mind works, you will waste your time. Let me, let, let me give you an example. I am a business consultant and I'm, I also work with families. Most of the time, people work on the emotions. And many coaches, they say, oh, the emotions. But you need to go to the subconscious mind because what controls the emotions is the subconscious mind. So work, go to the root of the issue. Go to the subconscious mind. And Nana Yoga helps you to do that. Mm -hmm. How to use the mind. So it's, it's a practice to help you uh, calm down and be, be close to nature. That's an important part. Part of his school that I like because I love music, it was very, uh, he put a lot of emphasis in music. There's a lot of singing in his school, beautiful singing. Because he said, when you sing, you raise your frequency and you connect with other dimensions. Not any music, obviously, special music. So, yeah. So you haven't mentioned meditation, <laughs> yes, uh, which yes. I would presume would fit into that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Into that. Um, Yes. Uh, place as well, but it's it, it's not a key uh, in this in, in this realm that you're speaking of. I mean, or is it's it? It's just a part. Yeah, it's an important part. We do meditation in silence, yeah. but you need to combine, and that's what I like because there's. I do not know how to explain it, but the but the part of music is very important, because for, for example, when you meditate a lot and you do not move, that energy is stuck in the body. And I saw that because I did Zen for many years. And you need to, yes, and you need to move it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what people do not know. So he gave the whole system. Mm -hmm. Because if you meditate a lot and you have a lot of emotions that you do not process, it's, it's like a, 
a magnifying glass. If you have a lot of anger and you do a lot of meditation, that anger starts to circulate. You see many meditators like they're just cooking that anger in silence. That's what you do with music. You process that. Everything is energy. So that's what I like from his school. He is a very complete system. Yeah. You know, recently, that this whole, the magic of 432 hertz, yes. you know, and that particular frequency is, I would presume, just really be listening to that. There's a whole mechanism inside of becoming that in the body. Exactly. That's a good point because they change to 440 to control yes. people. Absolutely. For you to know, everything is frequency. So these people that know the science to manipulate you, they change from 432 to 440. Just enough off. Yes. <coughs> so 430, yes. I have a lot of questions. Sure. So uh, are these teachings based on the Vedas then? No. No, this is initiatic science, and it's very complete. I mean, he, he adapted that, but he integrated both. Because any, <clears throat> okay, if you study history, the Vedic teachings came from Egypt. When Egypt went down, some teachers, some of the teachings went to India, some of them went to China. Mm -hmm. The Taoist. So he talks going back to Eve and Atlantis. He goes back to that era, Master Ombran. He, he, he talks about that openly. So this is very, very old. That is the reason uh, he was well known in Europe. And I met people that tell me, yeah, he, he says, you need to read the book several times because he, there are gems in the books. And uh, yeah, no, this is before the Vedic teachings. Yeah, it's before that. Yes. If you quiet the mind enough <clears throat> so that the spirit soul uh, can communicate <clears throat> or something like that, it's going to guide you on how to unfold. Correct? Yes. Yeah. That's the goal. It's what is called the inner voice of the silence of God, because everything is there. Everything is there. That is the reason you want to listen to that inner voice. That's one of the goals of meditation. Mm -hmm. Another name is what is called the vision quest, right? You want to know what is my mission. Some people, they, want, they have a big problem. They do a vision quest. Like, what is next in my life? So, yes, you want to listen to that inner voice because everything is there. You quiet the mind, you listen to that inner voice, is very important. And for example, it's about cycles, right? The Mayan calendar describes the cycles, okay? There, was a, there is a Swedish scientist, he wrote the book, The Nine Waves of Creation, okay? And he describes how the Mayan calendar predicted big, big changes during certain phases or years. So one of them was 1999. It was a huge year for evolution, like a quantum leap for humanity. And then personally, it was in 1999 when I myself quit my job as an accountant in Mexico. I, I was working in a big company and I moved to the Zen Center, I remember, I went to a Zen retreat in Mexico City in May of that year, and I quit my job in three months and in August, and I, I, I was in Rochester because I listened to that voice. And my meditation helped me to just to tune up, okay, do this now. So I confirmed what Callahan, Callahan said, yeah, 1999 was a big year. And when I asked people, yeah, that's when I get married, that's when I got divorced, big changes in their lives happened during that year. It was a big wave of change. So that because we are cosmic beings. So one being one advantage of meditation is to listen to that voice. Do I marry that person? Do I quit my job? Do I move to another city? Very important in life. Especially now with the fires that we have in California. Where do I move? 
in the US, what is going on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that meditation is an excellent tool mm -hmm. to We're listen. Equipped, we <laughs> are. We have everything. We've got it all. We have all the power. It is there. Yeah. That is the. I mean, you said with the, with the Qigong master in three minutes, they got rid of a tumor that took years to form. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. It's having the right knowledge. That's very important, especially now that we have so much information online, just garbage. <laughs> it's true. And, and that's another problem. Many, many people, oh, I am a teacher. I am this, I am that. And no way. So, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you're welcome. You. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Very incredible. Thank you for coming.